Yeah. Uh, uh, Dr. Merkel, uh, thank you very much. Uh, Greg and I were speaking earlier. Instead of using these chambers, why don't you use rooms where you cryopreserve people? You can get these rooms that are made uh, in several places in the world at minus 160 Celsius or whatever you want. Uh, therefore, you can put the person in. You can have a visitor visit for a minute or two and see their, their person, uh, their loved one. And um, also, actually, that person might get some health benefit from being at uh, minus 160. Um, interesting set of concepts. Uh, there are a couple things going on. First off, the size of the doer uh, influences the price tag. In other words, if you have a smaller volume, you have more surface area and therefore you have a higher boil off rate, so you have to spend more on the liquid nitrogen. As you go to bigger and bigger doers, uh, or bigger and bigger volumes, then the surface area goes down and the loss of heat goes down and the cost of pouring in liquid nitrogen goes down. On the other hand, you also have the logistic issues of moving things around and it is useful on occasion to move things. We do make moves uh, very rarely, as infrequently as possible, but when that is necessary, then having a doer which can be moved is useful. Uh, the concept of having rooms because that would reduce cost is one which is very interesting. Uh, the current technique has evolved as sort of a pragmatic compromise in terms of accessibility. You have to be able to pull patients out, put them in. You have to be able to move things around. You have to have some degree of incremental capability. Uh, obviously, if we were to build a very large system with only a few patients in it, it would be very inefficiently utilized. If we have the current system, which is the Bigfoot doers, you have these, these doers, those seem to be a reasonable spot right now. Going forward, um, there are a lot of options and a lot of possibilities. Two more uh, so quick questions. Um, Robert Bradbury and then Dr. Day. Um, regarding the question here, uh, if you have the technology to, to reanimate a body, then you're also in the era of very robust nanotechnology. And that would imply that you're also in the era where your 10 kilogram allotment of nano robots is capable of building you a sapphire mansion for free. Yeah, some very low cost. <laughs> and so the question is, is, does Alcor have a plan to reserve 10 kilograms or N kilograms of nano robots and loan them out on a revive basis so that you come back and get your house, you know, or mansion, whatever, each time you're revived, you revive the people on a schedule, you know, that allows the construction of the house on a per revival basis. And therefore you enter the world a much wealthier person than you were when you got put into the liquid nitrogen. And it also means you can essentially die and get preserved penniless and wake up a very, very wealthy individual. Uh, yeah, well, if you can take advantage of compound interest, then there are a lot of, uh, th there's a lot of, of attraction to, to the concept of waking up. You, know, you, you spend a few decades cryopreserved and then, hey, you got a lot of money. As far as specifically what Alcor says it will do, uh, basically we will do our damnedest. As far as the details of how that works out, how do I put it, you know? It, it looks like there's a lot of stuff to be worked out into exactly how that works out. So I, I have a hard time describing, yeah, you know, first uh, there, there, there's the, the, the first step where we do this and then, you know, we have the thus and such society which reintegrates you and, and gets you back on your feet and then we provide you with thus and such a stipend for thus in such a period. You know, we haven't worked that out yet. Uh, I, I think at some point we will, and obviously there's a lot of interest in knowing how that's going to work out. Um, one, of the, one of the legal constraints is that a 501c3, we, can, uh, we really can't offer to give money back to people. So one of the things is the wealth preservation trusts are separate they are legally distinct entities, so if you set up on a, a wealth preservation trust, it is legally distinct from Alcor. Uh, Alcor can look after you and, and you know, uh, look after your care, health care and well-being and things like that, but we're not uh, legally allowed to give money back, so we can't do that particular part of it. On the other hand, uh, you know, health care, well-being, I mean, you know, providing housing, we'll be working that out, I'm sure. Aubrey, a quickie. Yeah, um, so I may have missed this, but just coming back to the question of intermediate temperature storage, mm -hmm. I couldn't help thinking that it might be worth just looking up the 
boiling points and melting and melting points of some oh, some yes. simple chemicals. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Xenon looks very promising indeed. Um, it, it, it it melts at minus 120 and it boils at minus 110, and it's not very expensive. And uh, it, you know, people must have looked at it. Yes. What's the deal? Yeah. No, there's been a, there was a lot of discussion of you know which which chemicals look good. What are the temperatures we want? Uh, the, the, the trick is that if you pick a particular chemical, typically you get a particular temperature, and then Greg comes along and says, yeah, well, you should be five degrees higher because of you know, reasons X, Y, and Z. So we think having a thermostat on it would be very useful. The other issue that crops up very rapidly is when you look at them, you find that, oh, it costs a lot more, or, yeah, well, boiling liquid nitrogen, boiling liquid nitrogen, nitrogen, where? Oh, it's in air. So if I have boiling liquid nitrogen, no one gets annoyed. If you have other stuff that's boiling, uh, you start having to say, well, it's expensive to let it just boil away. Maybe you have to recycle it. So you have a recycling and recooling system. Or if you let it boil away, maybe people don't like having, you know, whatever it is. I don't know the specific answer on xenon. My suspicion is it's going to be relatively expensive. But, and, and the other question then is, you know, does the temperature match out precisely? So, you know, the current sort of thinking is, yeah, if we have a highly reliable system that's got a thermostat that we can adjust to whatever the, the temperature looks like it should be, then that looks like the best current approach. Yes, it's going to be more expensive, but it looks like, you know, there are a whole bunch of trade-offs. That looks like the kind of thing to do. So we need to stop now, Ralph. Thank you.